thank you very much, and thank you um, very much for the invitation to be here. It's really exciting to be at an OECD event which brings economics and urbanism together, and I think this is quite an innovative uh, gathering, so it's very nice to be part of it. Um, so I'm going to try and look at um, what Michael mentioned, this idea of agglomeration economies, um, how kind of cities work as ec economic incubators together with our understanding of urban morphology. And I will be building on the ideas of Jane Jacobs. Um, the structure of the presentation will be um, as follows. I'll look at some of her, Jane Jacobs' ideas about how cities function as economic incubators. And then I'll look at how we can kind of build conducive urban environments um, at three different levels. So starting off looking at buildings and frontages, then going up to the level of neighborhoods, and then looking at the city scale um, before making some conclusions. Uh, so Jane Jacobs, in two kind of seminal books, really talked about how cities can support economic development. And the first book is perhaps the best known, The, the Death and Life of Great American Cities. But she also published a book in 1969 uh, called The Economy of Cities. Um, and her idea was that cities kind of develop over time in a kind of branching process. So you may start with one or two economic sectors, but over time they diversify into many different new sectors. And um, this process is a process which is very much led by SMEs, small companies, who are kind of innovating incrementally because of the materials that they're using, because of the, ma the markets that they're encountering. They're kind of problem solving in a, in a messy way very often. Uh, and what's good about cities is that they provide the diversity of other types of activities going on around, which enables you to put your new products together with other kind of sectors. Um, so it produces this kind of ongoing um, incubation of new ideas. Um, and it's interesting if you actually look at the kind of economic theories, particularly economic complexity theories that have become quite popular uh, today, you can see that actually as cities do grow, they do diversify. So Jon et al. in 2015 did a very interesting study of US cities where they showed that actually it's an exponential process so that the larger cities become more diverse and the more diverse cities become again more diverse. Um, so her ideas do have some uh, traction in, in reality. And indeed, Edward Sawyer in 2000 um, talked about this self-generating economic culture of cities. Uh, and this has some policy implications, because whereas a lot of city governments think about developing top-down economic development strategies, to follow this line of thought, you need to think less about top-down planning, but actually about supporting a kind of fertile environment for economic growth from the bottom up. Uh, and that's partly about things like finance, having local banks, having, having loans available. Uh, but it's also very much about the organization of commercial space. So I've been putting some of these ideas to test in, in my research in both London, but also Manchester in the United Kingdom. Uh, so Manchester, you may well be aware, is one of the kind of original centers of the Industrial Revolution based around textiles, so um, I've done a sort of very qualitative uh, diagram here of the kind of historical branching process which has happened in Manchester since its origins. Uh, and in fact, the original uh, economic culture around textiles has branched and co-evolved with many other different local sectors, including dyes and paints and, and chemicals, which have also evolved into soap and detergents rubber and plastic, industrial gases, but also things like printing, machining, uh, textiles has really co-evolved with um, engineering and also actually more recently the development of computing and electronics. So obviously Manchester's not on its own in this process. This is something which happens both locally but also with lots of international exchange and Manchester's always been at the heart of a large international network. But you can still see a sort of path dependency in the economy. And actually today what I'm, what I'm doing is looking um, at the kind of potential for current supply chain and labor sharing networks between the industries that exist in the city. And this is just one part of a network diagram showing potential labor linkages. Um, and what's interesting is that you'll see some of those cities I just, some of those sectors I just mentioned that are still quite concentrated in the city, textiles, clothing, dye stuffs. 
And these, not only are these sectors still concentrated locally, but also you'd expect from my analysis to see more kind of supply chain linkages between those sectors and more labor sharing. So all of this means that when you're looking at the spatial development of somewhere like Manchester, you need to be thinking about these interdependencies. You can't really just be thinking about individual sectors. You need to be thinking about how the urban fabric is supporting these kind of cross-sector relationships particularly amongst SMEs, which I think are the most likely to be benefit from these kind of horizontal linkages. So when Jane Jacobs talked about space, she talked very much about very local spaces. She talked about buildings and she talked about neighborhoods, but she didn't really talk too much about the way cities function as a sort of global network. And I'll come on to that at the end. But I just wanted to give you a flavor of some of the research that we've been doing on buildings and frontages. And one of the things that comes out of this is the importance of adaptability to support SMEs. Um, so I've been doing some work with Professor Howard Davis, um, who's at the University of Oregon. We've published an article looking at railway arches um, in London. So railway arches, talking about re repurposing uh, buildings, railway arches were developed actually as part of the Victorian infrastructure for railways in the city. But they've been repurposed and reappropriated by many different companies. And a study that I did in 2012 showed that there were 165 arches with incredibly diverse uses. So there were people uh, producing food and drink. Uh, there were people who were actually using these spaces for theatres, cinemas, bars, metal work working, all sorts of things. Um, but actually, uh, roughly 25% were in manufacturing, small-scale manufacturing, and over 50% were SMEs. So this was providing, right in the heart of the city, a kind of set of spaces that SMEs could use. And even though they weren't built as business spaces, actually they've proved very useful because they're very adaptable. So when you move into a railway arch, it's like a blank canvas. You can, it's a kind of messy space. It's a slightly noisy space because you have trains uh, running overhead. So you can actually do messy forms of experimental production. Uh, you can also adapt them by putting mezzanines in. Uh, you can actually move, as you expand, you can acquire neighboring arches. So they operate like a modular sort of set of buildings you can expand into as you grow. And indeed, I looked, um, for example, at the London Fields Brewery, which was um, actually sort of creating 13 different local beers, but they actually gradually acquired arches, which they could use to sell the beers in a pub. They also had a concert space. Uh, so you can actually see how these adaptable spaces allow scaling up. Also, I've put a diagram here. We, we've kind of developed, have I, this idea of industrial streets. So the idea is, I mean, what's interesting about railway arches is they're linear. They go right through the urban fabric. So they bring small enterprise in with the kind of residential spaces. They're often very closely directly related to the street, which means that people move in and out of them and exchange ideas. And I saw, I've seen a lot of evidence over the years I've looked at railway arches of kind of sharing products and sharing innovations. Um, and the other thing is, because they're street facing, they allow manufacturing firms to actually start retailing directly to customers. They're also able to do wholesaling and distribution. And I think this is really important because a lot of our small enterprises in cities these days often go across these sectors. They're not just manufacturers, they're also people who are selling, retail, and you need spaces which allow people to kind of develop these different activities as they expand. Uh, and this is something I've also found um, in my research in Manchester. So there's an area in the north of Manchester called Strangeways, um, which is actually a very multi-ethnic area of bottom-up kind of economic development uh, around textiles, but also around clothing. Um, and what's interesting, again, is you'll see here there's a sort of street frontage where these firms are wholesaling. They're actually allowing people to walk around and choose which products they're going to put in their own shops and services. But if you see, they've actually got lots of warehouse space behind these frontages, which means that they can also very well engage with distribution, storage, internet sales. So they're, again, appropriated spaces being used for multiple uses. So how does that kind of adaptive building structure work at the neighborhood scale? Uh, and in this area, I'm thinking very much about this idea of generative street systems, um, but also hierarchies of space. 
Um, so Howard Davis talks very much about the fact that every neighbourhood needs a hierarchy of different sized commercial spaces for SMEs because you need very small micro spaces when you're first starting your business, cheap rent, flexible, but then actually as you expand you need bigger spaces. Uh, and this is a map um, done um, very meticulously by Cass Cities in London. They've actually looked at the old Kent Road, which is a big arterial route coming out of the centre of London, which has traditionally had a lot of manufacturing. I'm, I'm sorry, it's come out very pale. But you'll see that there are different parts of this system around the same street, which have very different plot sizes and very different urban morphologies. So... One of the areas around Mandela Way is actually very, um, you know, it's big plots, it's big firms, scaled up businesses. And you can see that the morphology is actually what we would traditionally expect in a business park or an industrial estate. These buildings are rather separated from the street. They're rather cut off from each other with car parts. But there are other parts of the urban fabric where you actually get lots of small plots actually arranged around street systems. So this is Hatcham Road, and you've actually got, again, this sort of generative structure where these SMEs are kind of sharing um, ideas, potentially. And actually, there's a lot of diversity of different uses in, in this area, including creative industries, food and drink, and again, things like metal fabrication, lots of different small firms in the same place. So I've also been using space syntax, so I'm grateful that Tim has given you a brief introduction to how space syntax works. Um, so as Tim explained, the idea is that you can look at the parts of cities which are more likely to generate um, lots of pedestrian movement. They're kind of areas which are buzzy and that you're likely to have more encounter between people, more face-to-face -face interaction. So this is looking at Manchester at the kind of big Greater Manchester city scale. Uh, but you can also use this as a tool to try and pick out the, small, the parts of the urban fabric um, at the more local scale that might um, support more kind of activity. And I don't know if you can see here on the left of the map, this is Trafford Industrial Estate. So this is the kind of where a lot of the industrial employment is. But actually in the northern and central parts of the city, you have more of a kind of um, sort of walkable set of environments. And actually, one of the things which defines sort of urban environments that can work quite well locally is a sort of grittiness. Um, so the idea is that actually if you have a grid uh, sort of morphology, you're more likely to cross people and encounter people in space. And there are quite a lot of grids in Manchester. Some of them have developed quite accidentally. Um, this is a, the northern quarter was, was developed in Manchester around a residential grid, but it's been very useful over the years also for manufacturing and commerce, partly because it developed with a set of back streets attached. So, for example, you have Turner Street, and then just next door you have Back Turner Street. You, you have Piccadilly, and just next door you have Back Piccadilly. And these back streets are very important for distribution, for sales, for kind of the movement of goods. So what started as a residential grid is actually very useful for bottom-up economic development. And this area I mentioned before, Strangeways, is also developed as a grid, partly because it was built all at once over an old brick field. And again, that's been very stimulating, I think, for actually the kind of economic development that happens in that space. So there are people like Southworth and Ben Joseph who've actually tried to look at these morphologies in detail to try and understand how these morphologies might work for encounter. So the key line here is the number of intersections on the bottom line. Um, so the more intersections you have, the more likelihood you're going to bump into people and cross people in space and maybe have fertile exchanges. So you can see that grids and what they call fragmented parallel systems work very well in generating quite a lot of encounter, whereas these sort of cul-de-sac type developments, which you often see actually in business estates and industrial estates, uh, only you know, much lower encounter rates. So you can, you know, as, as we've been hearing, look at the, all these things in a quite a scientific way to understand how morphologies might shape social encounter of businesses uh, in space. Um, so to come back to Strangeways, um, luckily the Greater Manchester Combined Authority have done a really interesting survey in, in recent years about textiles and all the different textiles companies operating in their city. And this actually shows the area of Strangeways, all the different kind of firms that exist there, many or mostly SMEs. 
Uh, so you have people doing spinning, uh, dyeing, homewares, clothing, leather, textiles, machinery, all in this same kind of local, fragile uh, ecosystem. So my question is, does this all matter? So obviously these spaces are providing a kind of place for firms to coexist. But if we're trying to think about these interdependencies that I talked about earlier, do these kind of neighbourhoods actually help these interdependencies to happen, help innovation to happen? And I've been looking at the past, actually, of Manchester as a city to try and get a clue to this. So this is a map from the 1940s of an area just south of the River Irwell. Um, I don't know if you can see, but it's very interesting. They have a kind of intermingling of machine tools, chemicals, carpets, chain works, all in the same very small space. And I think this intermingling has been quite crucial to how innovations have happened over time in the city. And to illustrate this, um, there's a, a, a picture of a raincoat here because Charles Mackintosh um, came to Manchester in the early 19th century he was a chemist from Scotland dealing with alkalines, and he realised that in order to waterproof garments, you needed to use rubber. Um, but actually, in order to kind of get rubber to be able to be impregnated or coated on materials, you needed um, a product of the gas industry, which is called naphia. And he actually found a little part of Manchester where he had a kind of fabric maker located next to a gas works and also located to a kind of a, a machine um, clothes making factory, all in the same small space. So even though he did rely also on imports from Scotland, he had a very nice local ecosystem. So my question is, is this still happening today? Uh, what I have found, I've been looking at those industries in Manchester that tend to be found in the same neighbourhoods. So, for example, computer programming, you do actually tend to find in the same neighbourhoods as where you have these darker lines as um, sort of other professional and science and technology activities, architecture, advertising. So maybe these kind of industries are getting something out of being uh, together in the environment uh, to be able to exchange ideas. And what I wanted to do was try and map that. So this is an area in, uh, called Altrincham in, in Manchester. Actually, I think it's South Manchester. Apologies. Um, and what I've done is actually find out the industries that tend to be co-located with telecoms. And I've put them on the map there. Um, and blue, the big blue sort of blobs are the telecoms firms. And then, in order to really understand how this neighbourhood might be a sort of opportunity uh, structure for those firms, I've coloured those dots up according to whether these firms might be potential supply chain um, providers or perhaps businesses that they might share skills and labour with. So uh, the red is for supply chain and the blue is where you've also got a labour sharing possibility. So this is quite experimental, but it shows how we might begin to think about these little fragile, interdependent ecosystems in cities and map them better so we understand their value before we, we lose them. Another important aspect, obviously, is how all of these commercial uses fit in with residential. Um, and actually, Space Syntax has a very nice way of looking at that. They look at um, what's called, what, what I would call round-the-corner diversity. So you tend to have some sort of economic development uses on one street, and then round the corner, either a different use or residential. And that helps to prevent conf conflict. Um, but you can also see even more intricate relationships between residential and commercial. So in London, um, Howard Davis and Ashley Donani have done a really nice study of um, a place called Winkley Estate in, in a residential area that actually has terrace streets with little workshop spaces behind. That's something we might think about rebuilding now that small-scale manufacture is coming back to the heart of our cities. Uh, Gillette Square in Hackney, it's a public space but with little pop-up um, micro-enterprise units. Um, which is actually providing a real vibrant mix of SMEs and also local public life. Although these spaces are just at risk from gentrification as, as other neighbourhoods, and there's actually worries that Gillette Square is going to be lost um, to a kind of gradual gentrification process. Um, so just in the time that I've got left, I wanted to then talk about this third level. So we've talked about buildings, we've talked about neighbourhoods. But this area that I think Jane Jacobs missed, really, was how these neighbourhoods then get connected into the city as a whole. Um, and what's quite interesting, when you actually look at how economic activities are distributed in cities, 
Uh, this is Greater Manchester. You can see that even this is, this is coloured up for manufacturing, so that the, these kind of areas of dark red are where the SMEs that are engaged in manufacturing are mostly located. And superimposing a kind of space syntax network of the principal streets, you can see they very much follow uh, not only the kind of centre of the Greater Manchester region, but also local town centres. So these SMEs are valuing global accessibility. It's not just important to be locally accessible, they want to be accessible, I think, to the whole region. Uh, and if you look at individual firms, so I also try to map um, textile manufacturers, often micro enterprises. It's even more clear, this linear structure of these different firms. Um, and what's interesting, I think, is if you look again at Cheatham Hill, this kind of diverse ecosystem has actually developed between two of these big arterial streets. Um, so if you look at where it sits again on the kind of more global street map, it's very locally connected, but it's also part of a global connectivity, which I think is important. And a, a theorist called Stephen... Um, Reed from the University, from the Technical University of Delft, has talked about how the fact that being globally connected is a kind of a way of irrigating local areas with potential. I really like that concept of how you irrigate places. So you don't just preserve these spaces, but you connect them up. Um, so to conclude, um, hopefully I've shown you that there's a mix that's required between adaptable buildings, generative neighbourhoods, and global connectivity. And I've been feeding some of these ideas into, um, as policy recommendations, into uh, Greater Manchester's um, Prosperity Review, which they've been doing as part of their industrial strategy. Um, so if anybody wants to read more information, this is available online. And also, we've been campaigning in the UK on behalf of the Railway Arches recently because actually they've been sold off to a private developer. So there's been a lot of talk about them and their value as commercial spaces if you're interested in reading about that. Uh, and I just thought I would leave you also with some background reading um, if you're interested in picking up. So hopefully the presentation will be made available afterwards if you wanted to access any of these readings. Thank you.